The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. And hello everyone, welcome to the Social Justice Forums. I am Darren Hyman. Of course, we thank you for joining us every week here on the Social Justice Forums. And if you're asking the question, what is the show really all about? Well, we take a look at the inequities that many people face. We talk about civic engagement, we find answers, solutions, and yes, we hear from some very special guests. So we encourage you, we got a great show coming up. The Social Justice Forums begins right now. Welcome back. Columbia Business School's Small Business Consulting Program is a student-led program working with numerous local businesses in West Harlem on their marketing, business, as well as their strategy needs. Now, the program helps establish business owners focus on their goals, maximize their time, increase revenues, and then build the right team, making that big, great leap forward. Joining us now and sharing more is the graduate of Columbia Community Business Program, Calvin Thomas. And uh, Calvin, good to see you, brother. To see you. Good to see you. Thank you for sharing with us here. And uh, you know, you're doing some great work and uh, really helping businesses and really people get a footprint, a better footprint uh, in this uh, society. So talk a little bit about the work that you do. So what I do is um, I have um, franchises called PostNet and the franchise is geared towards the, um, you, know, you know, serving the community with um, the shipping, printing needs, and computer access, um, you know, notary, um, private mailboxes, um, services along that line because the Bronx is pretty much underserved. So um, at the moment right now, I have four different locations open in the Bronx and I'm in the process of just trying to at least open a fifth location. So, you know, working our way to five locations. Awesome. And when we talk about small businesses, I always tell people small business is the lifeblood of America, but really uh, it's really a, a, a hard time for many people and particularly after COVID, really being able to survive, really being able to get back on their feet. Uh, what are you finding is the need and uh, that you could be able to fill that gap? So what I find, especially um, being, um, you know, I've been serving the Bronx for a long time. You know, I'm living in the Bronx also. It's just a lot of services are underserved you know more people you know venture out to Manhattan so um it's really no UPS stores in the Bronx no FedEx offices um so it's not really many places where people can go to ship um you know if they want to um patronize UPS or FedEx services that they have drop-offs the Amazon drop-offs which are labels and um even just to do some simple mailing where we can save them time and convenience even if they went to the post office sometimes it's a struggle getting in and out of the post office because they usually overcrowded sometimes and um, so we provide the service of people, you know, um, needing to get access to their email, scanning, faxing, notary. We just try to save time and convenience and make it simple as possible, you know, just to serve the community. Because every most of the service we are uh, need-based services. It's nothing really we do that's impulse buy, you know, and we just try to, you know, make sure we just serve the community and just do it in the right way, you know, with ethics and morals, you know, and uh, treating the people right. Yeah. And so there's training and workshops that are actually available. So walk us through some of the workshops that uh, people can take part in to really help them get an upper hand. Community-based program I did with Columbia, you know, Columbia Community Business Program, which um, I came in contact with them. I guess they sought me out. We got an email and asked me if I wanted to get part of the program, which is a two-year program. And um, it works with small business owners through um, the South Bronx and, uh, and uh, Upper Manhattan, Harlem. And um, which is a uh, it's an awesome program. So basically, they, they we went to um, all aspects of the business. We wouldn't have we didn't go into detail. I would say as if you know um, a full time student would do because we wouldn't have the time, you know, because we still got to run our businesses. But we kind of went into all natures of a running a business, and we really gave some uh, overview of what we need to learn and focus on. You know, what our key thing I took out of that was the finance part, the point of financing, you know, the profit and loss balance sheets, books. Make sure you know your numbers and just keeping good records. So that was the main key I got of it because I'm a, I'm not a student. Um, I never um went to business school, went to college, but that was just um after high school, never got a college degree or anything. So my prior highest, highest education is just a high school diploma at the moment. But yeah, so I was it was really valuable for me. So as you have this, you know, skill set here, talk to me about how it's really able to help to transcend where you are today. Oh, so the day is just it's um it's people who learn how to um the main thing is just learning how to um, 
you know, communicate and treat people, treat them the right way, genuine, you know? And it starts with that, you know, customer service. And then you provide, you know, your um, your knowledge of the products and service you're offering. So you, you don't want to, um, you can be nice with people, but you also got to have quality products and services and you got to live up to whatever agreement you do. So that's how I'm able to really, you know, thrive in a business that I'm able to keep expanding. You know, you just, because the customer, you know, customers first, and, you know, they want to go about their day. They don't come to you to be stressed out and, you know, inconvenienced because you, you're you not sure or you don't really know what you're doing. So it's just, you know, people, process, and products, you know, you got to master that. Yeah. So what does it feel like for you being an entrepreneur, really? Uh, you just opened up your, as you said, uh, at least for a fifth location. What's it been like for you uh, as a person that really has a great, you said, you know, didn't really do college, but yet and still you're able to have a huge footprint right now in an entrepreneurial way. Oh, man, it's, a, it's, it's an awesome feeling. You know, I really enjoy it. You know, you know, I have a passion for it, you know, so and um, I have a team that I work with, you know, that was growing within the organization that, you know, that's operating these stores. Um, it, it just, it's just something I like doing, you know, I enjoy doing it. It's not all, it's not all about, you know, the financial side of it. It's about building the team, building the business and being successful at something, you know, and having goals and trying to reach those goals. You know, our goals is to get to 10 locations throughout the Bronx. So, you know, we halfway there. I don't have the fifth one open yet, but we, you know, we have the, all the paperwork side and everything. So we're just doing a build down now. And I'm, you know, just serving the Bronx community. You know, I love the Bronx. So I always going to be serving the Bronx, you know? Yep. Yeah. And so as you have this fifth location and as you said, you're doing the build out and not yet done the build out. Uh, it's got to be an exciting time just to be able to have your business. But, you know, talk about, you know, being an African-American, uh, being a man of color uh, and yet and still being a business owner, because so many times we see other pictures and it doesn't look like us. But for you yeah. to be able to be that example to others in the community and particularly young people as to how you can really set your goals and not just set them, but honestly be able to achieve them. Yeah, um, I guess first and foremost, um, you got to start with um, with me. It's just to be mentally um, focus on um, staying positive. You know, you can't let a lot of things bring you down and um, negatively uh, you start doubting yourself. You know, when I started, you know, um, probably same way anybody else starts, you know, franchise business, you know, wasn't able to get no financing through a bank or, you know, you're not going to get no bank loans. You're not going to get many people that's going to really support your finance. So you got to figure out ways to kind of make it happen yourself. So, you know, I was able to figure out a way to get the store open and get the money to build the first one. And then, you know, I just went through the learning curve. I opened my first store in 2008. And I don't know if you remember, right in 2008, we had the, um, the market crash. So, mm. so, you know, sales was, um, you know, was, wasn't really there. So I had to fight my way through that. You know, I was opening and closing the store myself. I was just building, but I just kept, um, you know, a positive outlook on things and stay strong and just make that a stay more, stay, you know, stay up, stay to my ethics and beliefs, you know, always treat people right. And, you know, just, you know, just do what I need to do. It's, I know it's, it's, it's hard to kind of explain, but for more people to get out there and open their business, you just got to have a passion for it and go ahead and do it. And it's okay to fail. You know, it's okay to fail. And you just learn, you're like, so my failure didn't end up me having to close my doors, but I had these up and down where, you know, I hit rock bottom, you know, all right, let me fight, fight my way through this, fight my way through that and just keep building. And, and now I'm able to, you know, reap the rewards of all those learning curves and lessons that I went through. Right. You know, a lot of times I could have, you know, you know, quit or gave up, but that's not in my nature, but I could have easily use that excuse. So being a part of this program, uh, you know, when you talk about the Columbia program, knowing that, you know, you're a business owner, knowing that you're really trying to get your foot up, uh, how much of an advantage was that to take, you know, to take part of this program and from the perspective of really giving you the, what you need as far as a skill set. And then for what I use, what I, I like to use the term, the gas in the tank to help you to, 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 to roll on. Yeah. So, you know, you know, of course, being in that program, it helped me um, build my network. And um, and I was able to get a view from the educational side um, of people who go to business school and kind of what they what they learn and how, um, you know, um, the business schools expect businesses to operate, which kind of been successful. So I was able to get a window into that. 
And um, so that was a network. But the, the, the main the main thing I would say with Columbia Business School, it was um, the people I got to meet in the class and the different versions of what they went through. Um, so like I said, the finance, you know, the marketing, customer service, you know, there's a lot of little things like um, problem solving, I would say, how to uh, dissect the problem. You know, it helped me a lot. You know, um, it, it was just a lot that I really enjoyed. You know, and I, you know, I made sure when I, when I went to that class, I was gonna make sure I retained as much as I could, and then put it in practice. Yeah, we talked about the success. I'm gonna put you on blast for a minute. Ask you, what are some of the mistakes that you found that you made during this process that maybe the program helped you to kind of like alter and and recover from? Part of the biggest mistakes was my books, me, me keeping um, a record of my financial books, you know, I didn't, I, I wasn't on top of everything. I knew my numbers, I know my profit margins, what, you know, what I was selling stuff for, but I didn't keep great records, you know, so now I'm on top of my records. So if I need to pull a balance sheet, profit loss statement, you know, I can always get that stuff done immediately. You no, know, I keep good records on the financial side, which is always good now. So now I, I can't, I'm able to borrow money from banks. You know, I can um, do a lot of different things now. You know, just from that, you know, from having experience being in business, um, having my books up to date, you know, staying on top of your taxes, and, you know, all those little things that you, you really don't um, look at. It shouldn't discourage anybody from going into business these days. It's just a part of what you're doing. You know, it's not that not that difficult to get into business. I think we make it more difficult mentally because we, we, we put roadblocks up saying, oh, it's so hard. But it's not that hard. It's just actually just doing it and welcoming the challenges that come with it. So before we go, I want to have the opportunity to uh, let people know exactly where some of your businesses are located. Maybe there's somebody out there that says, listen, you know, uh, I've seen this brother. He's up and coming. Uh, I want to be able to support the work that he's doing. Okay, yeah, sure, definitely. So um, the first you know, flagship location that we opened, we opened on 149th Street in the Grand Concourse. You know what I'm saying? 557 Grand Concourse. That's our first location we opened at. I uh, opened in 2008, February 2008. That's where we started. So the next location was number two. After eight years later, in Parkchester, we opened them in Parkchester on West Avenue, 1451 West Avenue. And then the third one we opened in uh, 2018, which is on Fordham Road, right between um, Washington and Third Avenue, 460 East Fordham Road. Okay, so we're there. And then the fourth location, which is open in December 2020. And um, that is um, on Allerton Avenue right near East Chester Road, got that. And the next location is, is number five would be 1490, Daytona Park East. So right near where Claremont Parkway, Daytona Park East meet, coming out of the park, and we've got a location right there on the corner. We're just starting to build out. Just getting electrical work done on that, yep. Well, congratulations to you, my brother. It's certainly good to hear. Uh, that things are up and coming and uh, you've taken advantage of this program and not just taking advantage of the program, but really just taking advantage of being an entrepreneur as we celebrate entrepreneurs uh, in this month. Thank you so much for being with us and uh, best success to you. All right, thanks, Aaron. Definitely. Thank you. Appreciate the interview and thanks for the time. All righty. Well, listen, we want to let you know uh, you've heard where his locations are. Certainly, uh, if you're out there, you can definitely take a look and see and uh, support small business. Listen, we got to take a quick break. We've got more show on the social justice forums. Don't go anywhere. We're coming right back in a few.
know that people are dealing with the health crisis, but there's also a lot of food insecurity. We're giving out healthy food options, and that's what's key here. If you're a senior, you have a disability, they'll actually deliver meals to you. The residents are anxious, they're worried, they're scared, and they want to be tested. When things were happening in our community, and, and we couldn't get the help. And there's almost a presumption of criminality that, that attaches to your skin color. The site will prioritize those who are at highest risk in the population. If you feel symptoms and you'd like to visit one of these COVID-19 testing sites here in the Bronx, you may call the State Health Department's hotline. Important to note about this site is no reservations are needed. This is a walk-in clinic. A lot of us are out of work and looking for something to do. We have the machinery and the skills to make large scale of these masks and gowns. Take care of your people it's going to go way further than we actually can understand. Right now, employees like myself are just adjusting to the new reality. to the social justice forums we're glad to have you sharing with us recently on the social justice forums we had the opportunity to interview a very special guest SUNY Potsdam officer in charge Dr. John L. Graham who recently received the post of officer in charge which is the equivalent of being the president of SUNY Potsdam he took over for this semester started out very well and unfortunately died during the Thanksgiving holiday not only was Dr. Graham an educator, he was a well-known basketball player, a community activist, and somebody that had young people at the heart and mind. But not only that, a very close brother and a personal friend. As somebody who grew up in Harlem, we spent a lot of time uh, playing together, playing basketball together, at the same time, trying to get education down. And he was an inspiration to everybody. Really learning how to play basketball, that's one part of it. And playing basketball with him and winning basketball tournaments, that was one thing. But the one thing that stuck out about Dr. John L. Graham, or Leon as we knew him, was that he always had a propensity for education. After playing, what would he do? He would actually go into City College and sit in the lounge and be able to study and apply for his doctoral program or he'd prepare for a trip going to Africa, working with the United Nations in the Department of Agriculture. He was always a proponent for education. And then he got a, ch a chance to be a president, officer in charge at SUNY Potsdam. Well, as I said, he died recently and the students at SUNY Potsdam are in mourning. I, as personal friend, am definitely in mourning along with a lot of other people. But I wanna take a look back at that interview that we spent just a little while ago with Dr. John L. Graham as he talked about his career, his motivation, and his passion for education and the young people in the State University of New York. Hey, Darren, thank you so, so much. I'm so humbled to even be talking to you. You and I go back, oh God, many, many years. We go back from the beginning. So I'm just so fortunate uh, to see you excelling so exceptionally well in your career. And I'm delighted to be with you today. Well, I'm delighted to be with you too, brother. And I mean, it's a wonderful journey. We can talk about that a little bit later on, but uh, here you are as the officer in charge, which for some people who may not know, that's almost like the president of SUNY Potsdam. Um, but talk to us about your responsibilities at SUNY Potsdam. So, so Darren, thank you so much. So what, what happened is that probably back in June, uh, the president who was here, the former president who was here, notified the chancellor uh, that she was going to be moving on and accepting another opportunity. So the chancellor then reached out to me uh, with the board approval to see if I might be interested in taking over this role as officer in charge. And to your point, the responsibilities of the officer in charge is to execute the full duties of the college president. So essentially, I'm in the president's office. I'm making all the executive decisions, of course, collaboratively, uh, but that's the strength of the title. So the title seems to be a little bit uh, off-putting in the sense that some people would sort of align it with military, but mm -hmm. officer in charge essentially means I have the full authority by the board of trustees to make the executive decisions and take the appropriate executive actions as appropriate and needed for the campus. 
So you come in at a very unique time because here we are in 2021 navigating this pandemic. Uh, students are getting back into in-person learning after having to deal with the virtual environment. Give us a sense of what's going on at SUNY Potsdam now, given the fact that you guys are back to in-person learning. Thank you. So here's the thing, and I'm so happy you asked me that question. So what happened, obviously, during the pandemic, you know, we learned a whole lot in March uh, 2019. And of course, many of our students, if not all, basically all of our students went into this sort of virtual modality. Uh, and our faculty really did a great job of also making that transition. But I got to admit, it was painful on all sides. The faculty members would prefer the in-person instruction uh, delivery and the students would, per, uh, would prefer the in-person in experience for learning. So we had to deal with that dichotomy, but thankfully we all sort of got through that process. And now most of our students, believe it or not, as much as they use iPads and iPhones and all these fancy gadgets that they like and we all love, many of our students, especially in the SUNY system, really are high touch students and they really would like to engage with their faculty members uh, in person. But what, we've, what we're trying to do now is make to shore up the in-person instruction, but also leave a lot of space and room for hybrid instruction. And, and, and some students actually would like to remain in a, in a remote uh, instructional modality. So we're trying to do all those three things at one time, but definitely our footprint right now at SUNY Potsdam and many of our SUNY campuses is really to have our students back on campus, back in person, because again, our students, this is what they expect from us. Yeah. What can you tell us about, you know, you've worked for SUNY schools for a long time, State University of New York, for those people who may not be so familiar. Uh, and there is this uh, special aura, if you will, about SUNY students, the demographics of where they come from. For many of them in New York State, the opportunity to stay home in New York State and be able to actually get their college education there. And for it's, it's a win-win situation on, on a part of a lot of our students. Talk to us a little bit about the SUNY student and what you what, what you gained in your knowledge of them. Well, that's really good. So here's, here's the thing. Statistically, 97% of our students are actually from New York State. That's a very high number, right? So we have a tremendous footprint. And Darren, a lot of people don't realize this, but there's a SUNY campus every 30 miles in the state of New York. Wow. And also SUNY, SUNY owns... And I, this, I found this data point to be quite shocking. At least 45% of the state buildings, 45%, that's a huge footprint. So we go from all the way from Western New York, you know, uh, all the way down to downstate New York, which is in Long Island. So we have a SUNY campus every 30 miles. A lot of people may not know this data point as well, is that we comprise 64 college campuses. And out of the 64, 30 are community colleges and 34 are four-year campuses. And then among them, we have technology uh, colleges, uh, we have comprehensive colleges, and SUNY Potsdam is a comprehensive college. And then of course, we have, uh, we have research institutions as well, which, which are known as university centers. So we have a dynamic uh, mix. Now, what I will tell you to the second part of your question, which is mission critical, is that our students want, many of our students really don't necessarily want to be in New York City. You know, I'm from, I'm a Harlem guy and, you know, I wanted to be out of New York City for my college education. I wanted to have some sort of open air, some trees, some squirrels. I was looking for something different. So many of our students that I talk to on our campus, I'm in the northern country of New York, we're about 25 miles from the Canadian border. We have a lot of students, believe it or not, from the Bronx. Lots of students. I met a young lady the other day from Cardinal Spelman. You know, and she's on the, uh, the women's basketball team here. So we got students from the Bronx, Brooklyn, Queens, Long Island, and we have some really dynamic programs here, like the Crane School of, School of Music. So a lot of our students, city, with, you know, without necessarily being out of the state. So right. the state is big enough. So our students come here, they get a great experience, and many of them stay, or they may retreat back to the uh, to the city or the borough yeah. where they come from. So here you are as the president of SUNY Potsdam, officer in charge, uh, if you will, uh, and you have responsibilities and obviously also a vision and you have to really uh, navigate the helm. So talk to us a little bit about your vision for SUNY Potsdam. What are you trying to see occur this year in the area of your students as well as for your teachers? So thank you. So here's the thing. I just gave a sort of a welcoming address to the campus community on, on September 8th. And if you don't mind, I'll, I'll share that with you mm -hmm. uh, and Latricia. But here's the thing. I, I really came in with a, with a great deal of respect for what's happening here nationally. A lot of people don't realize that we have about 19 plus million students in college. 
We have about 5,300 colleges and universities in this country, about 2,000 community colleges. But the market share for our campus is about 3,000 students. So number one, we want to increase our market share in the, in the space of uh, getting more students. So to do that, we have to have, we created a four-point enrollment strategy. So the first point of our enrollment strategy is the North Country. We try to shore up our enrollment, uh, particularly with the students that are in our geographical location. That's number one. Number two, we want to sort of expand our footprint in New York City, those five boroughs, of course. Uh, and we want to try to get as many students as we can to be attracted to our campus because the campus really is a postcard. That's the second part of our strategy. The third part of our enrollment strategy is really to attract international students uh, to join our campus. And Darren, I might want to underscore this. When we talk about international students, we're also including students who are already here that might be dreamers, that might be DACA. We might, you know, that's a part of our dynamic mix for international students. And then the fourth part of our strategy, Darren, is to really what we call bring back the bears. The Potsdam's uh, logo is the bears right? Mm -hmm. The Potsdam Bears. So we want to bring back students who already have, you know, 90 credits, 115 credits, you know, uh, 75 credits that did not complete. So we want to do a, a degree completion platform that would give us a, a sense of, uh, of uh, building our enrollment. So that's the first part of the vision. The second thing we want to do is really restore confidence in the campus. Because again, as I mentioned, we have comprehensive colleges. We have 13 comprehensive colleges our campus has the lowest enrollment among the 13. We were always relatively small, but again, we want to get back to our market share. As I said, we have about 3,000 students. We would be more comfortable in a space of about 4,500 students. So we got a lot of work to do over the next three to five years. So building enrollment is a key. Restoring confidence in the campus that we're going to be a viable enterprise is also important. And then the third thing, Darren, which uh, I am I have make no bones about saying is that we need to set the campus up for permanent leadership. And that's important. Now, that, is, that doesn't disinclude me, but that's the direction I want to go. Increase enrollment, restore confidence. And the third thing is set the campus up on good financial footing to welcome uh, a permanent leader. Yeah. And so when we talk about SUNY schools, obviously you said 97% of those SUNY students are actually coming from right here in New York State. What is the biggest draw, if you will, for, for, for having that high percentage? Because we do know a lot of people can say, listen, you know what, I'll go, I'll go somewhere else. I, like you, you wanted to, you know, you wanted to scroll, you ended up going to University of Maryland Eastern Shore. Um, but what was the driving force, do you think, to, to really make students say, say I want to stay in state? Darren, here's the thing. You know and I know New York City writ large has about 9 million people, right? And they, you know, they, Brooklyn has what, 2.4, Long Island has about 3 million. And then any given day, it's about 11, 11 million people working in New York City. A lot of the students that I talk to, especially here, especially from Bronx, Brooklyn, Queens, Manhattan, Staten Island, Long Island, they tell me pretty much the same thing. I want to be out of the city. I, I want to sort of explore my horizons. Uh, the city is dense. Many of them even say that their households are dense. And they really just kind of want to get out and sort of spread their wings. And they kind of like want to learn in a more diverse setting. And believe it or not, you would think that there's a lot of diversity in New York City. Uh, but some students, depending on who they are and where they're from, they're actually looking for some exploratory type of diversity. You know, different faculty, different peers. They come for athletics. They come for our Crane School of Music. They come for our academic offerings. And, and believe it or not, the students I talk to, they absolutely love not being in New York City, but they love to retreat back to New York City. So this is really about getting a part of the market share of students that says, you know what, I love the state of New York, don't want to leave the state, but I want to have a diverse experience. And so they choose SUNY Potsdam as well as some of our other campuses. I want to take a moment and, and share with our viewers that not only are you the officer in charge of SUNY Potsdam, you've had a long history in the career of education, but you've also had a long career uh, as an athlete. Our brotherhood has actually shared uh, a lot, basically, on the basketball court, uh, yeah. as well as off the court as well. Uh, but I want to talk for a minute because you bring a unique perspective. I mentioned that you're a Division I athlete, University of Maryland, Eastern Shore, did very well there. Obviously, you do overseas, all of those great things. But you bring a unique perspective to the seat that you sit in right now because you also have a concept about athletics. And I want to talk about athletics and academics in this moment, because that's also a draw for students, because sometimes you can't make it to play at that big school the way that you do. 
but you do have the opportunity to come to a school where you can get good playing time and then also be in a college, a, a good college atmosphere. That is a wonderful and well-positioned uh, question and comment because Darren, when you come to visit, you've got to take a look at our Maxi Hall. It is unbelievable. I have never been to a Division III campus that has an ice hockey arena, huge volleyball court, indoor track, Olympic-sized pool. The basketball court is phenomenal. The sports programs here are tremendous. We have soccer and we have women's ice hockey. So, you know, I'm excited about that. But I want to just kind of go back a little bit about this whole thing about student athletes. One of the things, Darren, uh, that students will always want to be associated with is a winning institution. Many years ago, a study was done at Duke University, and they were uh, interviewing students randomly. It was a random survey. And they asked students, why did you choose Duke University? And these are non-student athletes. You know what the response was? I wanted to be associated with a winning institution. So one of the things I have said here at Potsdam since I've been here is that we want our student athletes to, one, win in the classroom. That's first, right? We want them to win in the community, and then we want them to win on the field, on the ice, on the track, in the gym, wherever they're competing. And we want our students to take the same thing, Darren, that you and I have always known, endurance, concentration, stamina, all these things are so important. And those are transferable skills. So everything that I learned at A. Philip Randolph High School in terms of going to practice, lifting weights, uh, staying with the team, being a unified uh, group, those are exactly the same skills that I'm using right now many, many decades later in my career. So I'm a big fan of student athletes. I'm a big fan of students who are pure academics. But I certainly know that there's something magical, Darren, about higher education leadership and I think higher education leadership, Darren, is really like a baseball team and not necessarily a basketball team. You know this. In a basketball team, one athlete can have a great day and say, hey, guys, you four don't even worry about it. I'll take the game over. Well, in baseball, you can't do that. The pitcher has to trust the outfield. And so if I'm pitching here at Potsdam as the officer in charge or as the leader, I got to trust my outfield. So right. that's what I think that that's what I'm bringing to bear at this institution is letting folks know that we are indeed a team. And as you know, Darren, and we all know, teamwork makes the dream work. Yeah. I want to share with people that, you know, um, our brotherhood goes a long way. I mean, I can tell a story like we used to play basketball. And when we played basketball, we would be finished playing basketball. But you would be the dude who says, yo, I got to go over here to City College, study. You were writing dissertations. You were getting your stuff in. And you said, listen, I'm going to get this master's. I'm going to get this doctorate. I'm going to do what I need to do in order to excel in the field of education. I know a lot of us, we were still basketball heavy, but you had the balance between both basketball and academics. And when I look at you now, I see a person that's now the officer in charge, for those people, that or the equivalent of the president at SUNY Potsdam University, but more importantly, an African-American brother who I get to see in the presidency. How do we get to the place where we can close that gap, where we can see more Dr. John Leon Grahams, where we can see more in, this, in the presidency? Because that's not something that we always see. Well, Darren, listen, I will tell you. So if we go all the way back, Darren, when you and I grew up and we played basketball, one of the things that you and I did and all our friends did, and we didn't even know it was gonna pay dividends down the line, is that when we played in 135th and Lenox Avenue, right? We played there. And then all of a sudden somebody said, hey, there's a game at 145th and Lenox. We played there. So we always said, yes. When we were growing up playing basketball, it was Marble Hill. It was everywhere. We played everywhere. King Towers, we played in just about every single tournament. So one of the things I always did when I was young is I said yes to everything. And then I tried to figure out, I said yes, so how am I gonna make yes work? So one of the things I did, Darren, as I got older, I started sort of positioning myself to say, you know what? Keep putting yourself in situations where you're uncomfortable. When you and I grew up, our generation, the motto was, if the shoe fits, wear it. Right. Now it's, if the shoe fits, you're not allowing room for growth. So I'm always looking to push myself. But I got to tell you something, Darren, and I'm going to be very honest with you, as I always have been. I have put out 125 applications over mm -hmm. my career, 125 and 118 times somebody said no to me. And then on seven occasions, I was able to get some interest. And then on one occasion, I got this opportunity. So being able to deal with no 
not now in maybe. I have dealt with that. I am still a very much young man in spirit. And I look at this screen and I see my image with the gray beard. And I say to myself, wow, man, you come a long way. So Darren, I would say to your question is that I was able to deal with no, a lot. Not now, a lot. In maybe yeah. a lot. And so I think that the new generation is needed of problem solvers to get into this space of higher education. But one of the things, Darren, I'm not going to do is that I'm not going to take the manual with me. I'm building around me and I'm sharing with young brothers and sisters to say, this is how you begin to build your portfolio. And even when I write letters of recommendations for, for individuals, they read the letter and go, oh my God, this is not me. And I say, yeah, it's not you now. But this is the this is the person that I see in the in the years to come. Yeah, and so for young people, obviously that's your passion to really see them go across the finish line. You understand also the burdens and challenges. I mean, we grew up in Harlem. We knew exactly what it was uh, to be, you know, growing up Harlem, uh, and yet and still being able to achieve and get to a level where we are today. What advice do you give for young people who are really trying to find that academic balance and trying to get across the finish line amidst all of the life struggles? Because let's be honest, some of the, you know, some of the people that we see in our SUNY schools, you know, their income may not be as high. Um, they're coming from backgrounds that, are, that have challenges and struggles, but yet and still in their heart of hearts, they want to be able to excel educationally. So here's the thing. I, I, Darren, no matter where I've been, I've been to multiple countries around the world. I've lived outside of the United States in three different countries. One of the things that I have always done, I have never changed my psychological zip code. My zip code is 10027. I'm straight up from Harlem, two blocks from the Apollo Theater. And those street smarts that I've learned navigating through the neighborhoods, those are the same things that I use to bear in my profession. I did spend a lot of time in the library. I became sort of a library guy and spent eight hours a day in the library, but I use that endurance and stamina from athletics. So what I would say, Darren, it's, it's a mix of taking the fervor from the Bronx, from Brooklyn and Queens and your survival skills of navigating that neighborhood and then developing stamina and endurance and thinking about what it is that you wanna do next. But Darren, I wanna just share this very, very briefly. So the world's population is 7.4 billion people, maybe 7.5 billion. If we were to take a photograph of the entire world's population, what would most of us spend our time doing? We would be looking for ourselves in the picture. So that is exactly what it is that I was doing my entire life, is trying to find myself in the world's picture. And as the campus leader here at Potsdam, I'm giving every student a virtual mirror that when you come here, you find yourself in the world's picture. Yeah. Before we go, I want to get you the opportunity to really just share your heart. Uh, I know there are a lot of people out there watching and their parents and their students who are watching uh, and those who really are thinking about this thing called education. Uh, what would you say to parents, students and educators on behalf of where you sit right now, Sully Pasta? So I would say this. If you want your son or daughter to go far, then they really have to physically go far. When I left a. Philip Randolph High School and graduated, I had a full scholarship to Eastern New Mexico University. I chose an institution that was so far away from New York City that I could focus. And then I was very fortunate my sophomore, junior, and senior year to have a full basketball scholarship to Maryland Eastern Shore. So to me, let not distance be the reason why you uh, limit yourself. If you really wanna go far in this world, you literally sometimes and figuratively have to go far because success is not always at your door. It's not at your neighbor's house. It's not 10 blocks away from where you live. Success might be very, very far away from where you grew up. Right now, Darren, I'm about what, seven hours out of New York City. And I'm extremely comfortable here because uh, I've sort of resided in myself that I'm a Harlem guy, drop me off anywhere. I'm dad, caregivers, grandparents, loved ones, relatives, faculty, staff, students, whoever you are out there, if you want to go far, then go far. Far as 25 miles from the Canadian border, Dr. John Graham, our guest here on the Social Justice Forums. My brother, it's been great to have you, man. And uh, you got to come back and share with us again. Yes, sir. I love you, man. And thank you so much for the opportunity. So I appreciate you. All right, Dr. John Graham, our guest here on the Social Justice Forums. Stay with us. We got more show coming up. We're coming up. And a few.
back to the show. Hunger Solutions New York is a statewide not-for-profit organization that's actually dedicated to alleviating hunger. They strive to maximize participation in and support for federally funded nutrition assistance programs, as well as focusing their efforts on the most vulnerable populations, including children, seniors, veterans, and people with disabilities. Joining me now and sharing more and discussing the work that goes on as the Director of Communications and Public Affairs at Hunger Solutions New York, Sherry Tomaski. And uh, Sherry, good to have you. Thank you so much. I'm really glad to be part of today's conversation. Yeah, so when we talk about the work that you do, please uh, just give a little more background. I think I gave a little intro, but for somebody who may not know, please take a little time to uh, introduce us to the organization. Sure. Well, we, as you said, we're a statewide organization. We're based a little north of where you are. We're up in Albany, but our services go um, across the state. And we are focused on uh, making sure that everyone who is eligible in New York State has access to federal nutrition assistance programs. So those are programs such as SNAP, WIC, which is the Women, Infants, and Children's Program. We focus on access to school meals as well as summer meals for children and the child and adult care, uh, the child and adult care food program, which provides meals to children in daycare and after school programs. So our goal is to make sure that for all of those programs for which people are eligible, they know about the program, they know how to access the program, and they're able to use the program to put more food on the table for themselves and their families. And we think that that's one of the most important ways to fight hunger here in New York State. When you talk about hunger in New York State, very important because we know that COVID has further exacerbated what's going on and the issue of food insecurity. Give us a little bit of your perspective of how you see food insecurity across the state, uh, particularly at a time like now. Sure. Well, COVID definitely has shed a lot of light on um, hunger and food insecurity, not only in New, in New York State, but across the country. And what I think has happened, too, is it has broken open a lot of the disparities that were previously there, but have also gotten much worse um, during the pandemic. For example, households with children are actually much more likely to experience food insecurity than households without children. We also know that Households um, with Black and Latino residents are also more likely to experience food insecurity. And so we've seen um, disparities in that way get much worse, where the burden is actually much greater on those more vulnerable populations than they had been. And I think all of that is um, pointing to the need for more attention on both emergency food programs, as well as making sure that we have a really strong safety net in terms of SNAP and WIC and other federally funded nutrition assistance programs as well. And so as we talk about food insecurity, it's a huge issue that's across the state, a huge issue across the country. And I know there's a great push to really get our elected officials to really intervene and be involved. Talk about the work that's being done uh, that's really addressing that from a governmental perspective and the advocacy. That's a very good point. And I do think that without government intervention, hunger and food insecurity would be so much worse than it is right now. We strongly believe that many of the relief efforts that were put in place by Congress and here in New York State avoided a much worse hunger crisis than we may have seen otherwise. So even though the data shows that food insecurity has gone up, especially among vulnerable populations, it has not gone up as much as it otherwise would have without the immediate help that Congress and the state put into place. So at the federal level, one of the things that we're focused on right now is to urge our members of Congress to pass the Build Back Better Act, because it has several provisions in it that are going to help bridge the gap for many children, specifically in New York and across the country, um, in terms of hunger and food access. Specifically, in this legislation that is being considered right now, there are provisions that would allow for uh, greater access to school meals for children who may not meet the current income requirements for free meals, but may not live in a household that can afford to pay for lunch at school every single day. Now, in New York City, this program has been in place for several years now, where all public school students are eligible for free breakfast and lunch at school. But that is not true in many districts 
in upstate New York and in Long Island. So it, under the federal provision, we could fill a lot of those gaps by um, expanding access to free meals for many more children uh, under those provisions in, in the federal law. And this is something that we've been advocating for for quite some time, but the pandemic has really demonstrated why school meals are such an important part of each and every day for children, especially low-income children who may not have regular access to healthy food at home. So that is um, the main reason why we're pressing for passage of the Build Back Better Act, because it will help so many smaller, more rural districts in different parts of New York State um, bring access to those meals to children. But there's also some other provisions in that bill that would benefit children across the state, including children in New York City, and that would be a summer EBT program for any child who's eligible for free or reduced price school meals. In this legislation, there would be a $65 benefit to help provide food over the summer when meals at schools are not readily available to those families. And that again is something that child nutrition advocates have been asking for for quite some years. And we've now come to the point where there seems to be the political will to bring this um, into policy. And so this is something that we're pressing for um, very strongly with our both our US House members and our senators. Yeah. And I know that the, the work that you do really in bringing attention to hunger, uh, I want to take a moment just to focus for a minute, you know, on your anti-hunger prioritization, because um, it's important that nobody be left hungry in a time like this. Nobody will be hungry left at all. Uh, but unfortunately, when we look across America and particularly here in New York State, there's so many people. And I think we talked about children. It's been proven that, you know, that sometimes the best meals that children get during the course of the day is what they get at school. Um, and so share with us a little bit about the uh, anti-hunger priorities that, you, uh, that you've that you been working with. Thank you, yes, you, you said it quite right. And um, access to healthy meals at school really is a matter of equity. And it is a matter of uh, providing every student with the same benefits and the same um, abilities to succeed in school without making that success contingent on whether their family has the means to support, you know, access to those meals uh, in school for a cost. So one of the number one priorities that we're working on is access to free or free and reduced price school meals for all children statewide. And whether we accomplish that through federal legislation or through legislation at the state level, in the absence of federal action, that is something that we think is just a, a very pressing need right now in our state for all children. There's so many children that fall through the cracks and, and cannot get free meals at school, but yet are um, definitely in need. And we think that that is one of the best ways that we can try and shore up food insecurity among children, which really is a, a way to bring so many families, you know, sort of a, above this existence in poverty and give them a chance to you know, have children who have access to healthy food as, on a regular basis and who really can survive and thrive in school, which as we all know is going to set them up for future success in their life. So that's one of the ways that our child nutrition prioritization is focused. Um, but I do wanna turn just for a moment over to the SNAP program because mm -hmm. some folks may not realize, but SNAP is actually the largest nutrition assistance program in New York State. Over two and a half million people participate in the SNAP program and they receive benefits each month on a benefit card that they can use to buy food at local participating retailers. We did see uh, quite an influx of new um, SNAP uh, recipients during the pandemic, as you might imagine, as people's income went down or went away, they became eligible for the program and used that program to provide food for themselves and their families. Now, during the pandemic, the SNAP program provided extra benefits for all who were enrolled in the program. And that has helped many households maintain access to food when they may have otherwise had to have made terrible decisions between buying food and you know, perhaps paying for medication or other necessities. But those emergency benefits you know, are scheduled to go away at some point in the near future. And that will create you know, a situation where those households will revert back to the lower benefit levels that they received during the pandemic when they may not be fully recovered financially from what 
you know, the pandemic has done to themselves and their households. So we are trying to advocate for a way to make sure that those households have a little bit more of a, of a seamless transition or an easier transition for those, um, you know, what's called a benefit cliff, you know, so that they just don't sort of fall quickly into a place where there's not sufficient funds to buy food for themselves and their families. And there's a couple of ways to, you know, sort of address this through benefit, um, you know, through the benefit formula for the SNAP program, but we are trying to, to think of ways and help with policy solutions to help make sure that people don't have this, you know, pretty dramatic impact on their food benefits hit them, you know, rather unexpectedly. So that is another way that we're trying to focus our energy and our priority on the SNAP program. And there's one other program that I'd like to mention as well, and that is the WIC program. And mm. as you may know, WIC is a program that provides not only food benefits, but healthcare services, breastfeeding support, and other healthcare referrals for all families who are eligible. And in order to be eligible for a WIC, in, in addition to meeting income guidelines, um, WIC is for women who are pregnant or have infants or children up to the age of five at home. And those families can receive um, the benefits that the program offers, as well as a lot of support and a lot of extra help um, meeting the nutritional needs for those young children in the home. And we know that when children's nutritional needs are supported in their earliest years of life, they are the most likely to not only succeed in school, but to uh, flourish beyond school as well. So those critical years of age zero to five are really, really important to make sure the nutritional needs are met. So our organization is working with the New York State Department of Health to do some more outreach and some enhanced education to help make sure that people know that they're eligible for WIC and how to access the program because only about half of all eligible people in New York State are enrolled in the WIC program. So there's tens of thousands of families who could be benefiting from the WIC program and are not. And we'd like to help break those stigmas and help uh, bring people closer to that program. You know, you mentioned about being eligible for WIC and you, and you just jumped off into that. I was going to go back and ask the question about SNAP because uh, what are the SNAP eligibility requirements? Sure. So um, the eligibility requirements basically mean that a household and all of the people in the household who are eligible for the program need to meet an income test. And those income tests are slightly different depending on the circumstances of the household and who is in the household, but it's usually anywhere between 150 and 200 percent of the poverty level. And so if there are senior citizens or children that live in the household, um, or households that have a lot of childcare expenses, those income limits are a little bit more generous to allow for that. Um, and a household also has to meet citizenship and residency requirements as well. And then once they um, are approved in their application, they would receive a benefit card that would put those benefits um, you know, into their hands each month that they can use at, at uh, approved retailers to buy food, just like they would with a debit card. Yeah. And then also when it comes to WIC, what are the eligibility requirements there? So for the WIC program, again, families need to meet an income test and their income just needs to be um, below a certain threshold in order to be eligible. They also would need to make sure that that so the people who would be eligible for benefits have to meet the definition of who's eligible, which is a pregnant woman or um, a mother who is breastfeeding a child. Um, and then infants up to the age of one, and then additional children in the house up to the age of five. So those individuals are eligible for the benefits in the program. But it's important to point out that if there's, say, a grandparent or a father who is the primary caregiver for those children, they can apply for WIC benefits for the children and, uh, and receive those benefits and be the conduit for those. So not just moms can apply, any guardian or caregiver can apply for the children that they're caring for. And the WIC program, um, once they meet the income guidelines and make sure that all in the family are eligible, um, there's some nutritional guidance that's given and there's a nutritional assessment done to make sure that the benefits meet the unique nutritional needs of the individuals in that family. Yeah. So before we go, uh, how do people find out more about the work that you guys are doing? Well, thank you for asking. So um, 
the best way that people can find out about the work that we do um, is to visit our website, which is hungersolutionsny.org. But I'd also like to put a plug in for a special website that we run, which is called foodhelpny.org. And if anyone is interested in getting help directly with SNAP or WIC, we have a network of partners all across the state that will work one-on-one -on -one with clients on their applications. So Food Help NY, you just put in where you live and you can find the closest coordinator near you who can help you with a SNAP application and answer any questions you may have. Sherry Tomaski, thank you so much for being with us and the work that's going on at Hunger Solutions. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. All righty, and we'll definitely try to check back with you in the new year, God willing. Well, I want to let you know that we've come to the end of our show today. Hope you enjoyed this week's discussion on the social justice forums. Again, want to let you know also that you can catch the Recablecast right here on Bronx that's Channel 67. If you want to join the conversation and present your point of view, you're more than welcome to visit our social media platforms at Bronxnet TV, and there you can uh, chime in and let us know what you think. Until the next week, we'll say take care, God bless. When we come back and elevate the conversation and the discussion and some exciting guests on the social justice forums. I'm Darren Jaime. Take care.